Hello, Strange Owl fans. Uh, JM here, and I have with me today uh, the creator of uh, Space 1889, uh, Frank Chadwick. Frank, thank you so much for uh, coming on to just talk about Space 1889. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. Um, uh, so what would you like to talk about specifically about the game? Or do you have anything in mind? Oh, yeah. So uh, Space, you, you came to uh, uh, Game Designers Workshop uh, back in the day with this idea for this new role-playing game. Where did Space 1889 come from? What was kind of your sources and your impetus for putting together kind of this very classic steampunk role-playing experience? Yeah, before there really was uh, the, the word steampunk uh, in, in wide use, but uh, that's really what it was. Um, it came from, it, well, part of it, a big part of it was um, growing up when I did, there was a period when Victorian science fiction movies were kind of all the rage. Hmm. Uh, there were a whole bunch of them, all based on uh, the the stories of Jules Verne, you know, like from The Earth to the Moon and, and some H.G. Wells stuff, The Time right. Machine, First Men in the Moon, um, Rope, uh, uh, Master of the World, um, and then the, and then at, in in uh, when I was young, I'd read a lot of uh, uh, John Carter of Mars, yes. the uh, um, Ed Grace Burroughs stuff. Yeah, I so, love John Carter. Yeah, uh, so you kind of put all that stuff together, and uh, it, it, for me, it was just kind of a natural uh, that and um, an interest in um, the, the warfare in the colonial era. You know, there have mm -hmm. been a lot of films about that too, Zulu and right. uh, the Four Feathers, and uh, um, so kind of all that kind of came together, and uh, um, I just thought it was a natural, and no one had really done it before. There was a little bit of at that time, there was just the beginning of some steampunk writing and science fiction, but nobody had ever done the game. And so I thought, well, you know, who doesn't like flying ships? Right. Uh, what was, uh, like, kind of back in the day, uh, you know, again, uh, so I'm from, I'm from Chicago, so, mm -hmm. right, Illinois, Illinois gaming uh, forever. How did, how did GDW react to the initial pitch? Uh, what were some of your key... Uh, what were some of your key fun memories from bringing this this game from kind of a concept into into reality? Well, I was the president of GDW, so the president reacted well. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, it, it wasn't that tough a sell, really, to the rest of uh, uh, to the rest of the the the, uh, um, the management, and really the and and once everybody kind of got the idea everybody came on board pretty well and, and really kind of got fired up about it. Right. Cause at that time, there's not a whole lot of steampunk to like now steampunk is a, is a genre word, right? We can say mm -hmm. steampunk and immediately people get the tropes. They get the ideas of what's going to be going on. But as you said, at that time, it was possibly a little bit harder to sell. Like I said, I'm not even sure that the name had been invented yet. Um, I think a writer by the name of Jeffers came up with the name steampunk. Um, I'd have to check that. Um, I used to know that, but I've forgotten now. Um, uh, but they, they, there was, there were, there, like I say, there were some uh, some science fiction short stories that could kind of fit in that genre. Right. Um, the uh, I remember the, uh, the now I can't remember the name of the author, but uh, he, uh, he did a series of stories about the uh, Istrian Pannonian Trans Balkanian Empire. Oh wow. Uh, Yes, this imaginary empire in the middle of the Balkans in about that period that had a little bit of magic in it, a little bit of advanced technology. Um, so there were stories like that, but there, it, it hadn't coalesced into any sort of uh, uh, real movement. And I think a lot of people remembered all the H.G. Uh, mm -hmm. Wells and, uh, and Jules Verne and Edgar Rice Burroughs stuff. So it's not like it was completely, it, it's not like the, nobody had anything to to tie this to when they saw the game. It's funny how you know, people would see the pictures, you know, the initial artwork we did for the game, you know, and um, because the first game was the the prequel to the role playing game was Sky Galleons of Mars. Yes. And people just looked at it and got it immediately. You know, these flying ironclads and these flying sail powered ships. Um, so uh, uh, visually, it was very easy to portray yes. it. It was really easy to show. Uh, Victorian uh, people and Victorian you know, uh, era soldiers fighting aliens, uh, you know, with uh, 
the, the uh, you know, with more primitive weaponry. I mean, it was this aspect of colonialism and science fiction together that, it, I mean, it was just, a, it, it was really easy for people to get their heads around it. Right. And Tim and I talked about it in a lot of ways. Well, there may have been some science fiction stories that came before really one of the, one of the key influences of space 1889 is it sort of helped solidify what steampunk looked like to a lot of people there may have been covers oh, there may have been you know one or two pieces of art but this was something that had art all the way through and kind of solidified what we think of steampunk kind of going forward i think that's absolutely true i, I you know i probably never thought of it that way but you, that, that's absolutely true i think it was one of the first um uh, detailed visual imaginations of that sort of world and what the technology look would look like yeah um at least in in gaming right um in gaming so you mentioned sky galleons of mars how did that come about and you refer to it kind of as the prequel to the role-playing game how did how did the, how did the two back in the day intersect because when we talked with uh daryl about this newest edition space 1889 mm -hmm. after he's like uh, there's a lot of Sky Galleons of Mars kind of baked into the new edition of the role-playing game. So tell us a little bit about that, how that came to be. Well, it was a combination of everybody liked uh, kind of sailing ship games. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody likes airplane games. Mm -hmm. Everybody uh, likes uh, the idea of ironclads and all this. And, and it just putting all that together in one game, a, a pretty simple game yeah. um, in, in terms of its mechanics that, but with a lot of variety in the ship capabilities, it was an it was a really easy, natural sort of uh, way to do it. And the reason we did that before the role playing game is we wanted to do something that really showed physically um, uh, what the world looked like um, and captured that the kind of the unique aspect of it. And flying ironclads and flying sailing ships was you know on a Martian landscape was the oh, perfect yeah. way to do it. Um, now we planned on uh, the, the the game almost came to grief on that because we had enormous production problems in, in terms of getting the three dimensional plastic pieces. And that almost derailed the whole thing, and it it delayed the game. Um, while while we kind of worked all that out, we had we had someone who thought he could do it, and then that kind of fell through, and we were left with some molds that didn't work. We had, you know, I, had to, I had to go out looking for machinists, you know, machine shops that could turn these molds into something useful. And so, I mean, it was kind of an adventure. Um, that was way before everybody kind of cracked the code on how to how to make really good plastic uh, pieces uh, in, in things other than, you know, tens of thousands of runs. Right. Um, so, uh, but I, from the very beginning, I really, really wanted plastic pieces in this game, not counters. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was really important to the look and feel of the game. Right. It, um, it makes it so much more striking when you're looking at actual physical representations as opposed to just, uh, I, I grew up, my first, my first war game was uh, Omaha Beachhead. Mm -hmm. It's just thousands of chits to like, to place out. There's, <laughs> it's just. Like you, you've got to use your imagination, but it doesn't capture the imagination in the same way right. that a, a beautiful uh, plastic piece can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's uh, th that's where all that came from. Now, the the amount of um, I, I wish it hadn't taken quite that much time because mm -hmm. it took a little development and creative time away from the role playing game. Um, but I think we, I'm still ha very happy with it. Uh, the uh, it's funny that at the time. Um, there were some people in gaming who really, who really thought it was a dreadful mistake. Um, there was a, there's a group called the, um, um, uh, it was the Academy of Game Critics, but it was really a, a, a fun, it, it was not that serious. It was okay. a bunch of guys that got together once a, a bunch of people, not um, of, of industry professionals who got together uh, in a bar every year at, Gen Con and voted on like the, the, all these negative awards, the worst games of the year. And it was all, in, it, like I said, it was all yeah. fun, but we did win three awards that year. You know, one of them was like the, the, uh, the shortest half-life. I mean, it was predicted that this game would have the shortest half-life of any role-playing game that came out that year. And it's still around yeah. decades it, later. I mean, it's probably outlasted anything that came out that year. Well, yeah. And, and there are multiple companies have, uh, 
picked this up, I know a lot of mm -hmm. game designers that I love point back to Space 1889 as kind of one of the watershed moments for them in gaming. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. What does, what about the Space 1889 setting do you, if you had to give a high level overview to somebody who has never heard about it, what, how would you describe it? And what would you say is the most compelling aspect of Space 1889? Um, Space 1889, the core of Space 1889 is, um, in, in some ways, the same as the core of, um, say, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, it is, what if science worked the way Victorians thought it was going right. to work? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it is their, their, specul you know, their speculation about how the world works and, and the future of technology. Um, which they thought was you know, right upon them. You know, all this stuff was 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 right around the corner. Um, so that's really the core of what it is. What if the world worked the way they thought it was going to? What if the way they imagined that? It, and it really is an imagined future, but it's it's imagined as it was imagined by the Victorians, right. by the writers in that period. Which is Victorian one of the, and Edwardian. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the the things I love most about role playing games is that it allows us to step into a mindset that is not our own and develop some empathy and some mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. understanding of humanity. I think it's C.S. Lewis who said, you got to keep reading old books because old books will point out uh, the, the way the, that other people saw the world and their own mm -hmm. flaws. And mm -hmm. by doing that, we start to learn what the flaws of our society is. And so I love the idea that role-playing games allow us to do this. Oh, uh, it, yeah. I mean, I think it ex this is an example of role playing, but when you go back and read now, um, I, and I don't know how recently you've read it, uh, um, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Oh, yeah. It's an indictment of how humans treat animals. Yeah. I mean, at the core of that book, mm -hmm. it is this. It is it is a, 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 a an indictment of the ethics of how humans treat animals. Because what it really says is the Martians aren't cruel. They treat us just the way we treat animals because they're that much smarter than us. And so they, you know, yeah. we got no complaints. It's kind of what he, it, this, he doesn't say it in quite those words, but he comes really close. No, yeah, he, he's, and things. that's, that's yeah. the subtext that's going on throughout uh -huh. the War of the Worlds. It, it absolutely yeah. is. And of course, then, then uh, our asses get saved by bacteria, which is the ultimate you know, irony of the book, right? Right. Something, I mean, something so low that we don't even think it. about it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about Space 1889 after the newest, mm -hmm. uh, the next installment, if you will, of these mm -hmm. uh, next chapter in the Space 1889 uh, legacy. Have you had a chance to look at it? Have you talked with Daryl at all about it? Uh, oh, yeah. I Early on, I, I, I reviewed it. I, I looked through it. Uh, his, uh, his pre we talked about it initially. And some of the world building aspects of it, and I looked through it, and I tell you, I love the character generation yeah. section of it. I really, really like the character generation section. He's done a terrific job there. Yeah, I'm um, really looking forward to. I've got the chance to run a couple of play tests for my play test groups, and they have loved building characters. And they just they were coming from a, a much more uh, sort of a grim dark play test that we were playing, and so to play. Mm -hmm. In Space 1889, as heroes, as Victorian heroes, they felt mm -hmm. it was a breath, breath of fresh air, is how they put it, <laughs> because it's it's so, Daryl has tuned the rules very well to replicate that Space 1889 Victorian science fantasy feel. Mm -hmm. And he's gone way beyond, uh, way beyond what, we, we had, um, I, I think, a lot of our stuff in character generation I liked very much in the original game, but I think he's gone way beyond that and yeah. really um, broadened the, uh, um, the 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 range of characters that it's possible to game, and but also deepened them. He goes a lot deeper into uh, generating those yeah. characters. Um, I, I think it's that's a terrific piece of work. And I love that he kept the hey, here are what the Victorian values and ideals are mm -hmm. because. Mm -hmm. If you just go to it as a modern person, you're going to miss a lot of what's going on culturally mm -hmm. and um, the way people interact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else you would want to share about Space 1889 or any uh, favorite stories from the early days of the game? 
Um, what do you think? There should be. Um, I, I know I, I uh, one of the, uh, um, I, there were a whole bunch of gaming groups in the area that I'll tell you one of the things uh, about Space 1889 that I thought uh, I was really happy about was that we we drew a lot of female gamers into the game awesome. uh, at a time when a lot of you know, now you know, Dungeons and Dragons did as well, uh, but there were a lot of role playing games and a lot of board games and, and, and miniatures games that I, I would say were not always female friendly. I mean, it's, it, they, it's not that gamers were uh, you know, bad to them, but the game, it, it, the games weren't as open to female yeah. characters um, and Space 1889 really was. Uh, so we ended up with a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of women playing. And I liked that. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, we also had an awful lot of people who got very invested in their campaigns. We had came, uh, we know, I know that we had campaigns that went on for years, oh, awesome. uh, at least in central Illinois. And, uh, um, people kept coming back to the game and keep coming back to those characters that they had, um. So that, so those are the, you know, that, that, that's kind of what I remember a lot about the early one, about the early game. Awesome. Now, Daryl is advancing the timeline a little bit. The reason it's Space 1889 mm -hmm. after is that we're setting it in actually Space 1899. So we're on the cusp of a lot of shifts in at least our real world history that this is based off of. We're going to mm -hmm. see, right, the turn of the century, the build up to World War One. uh, what are your thoughts on uh, kind of seeing what comes after, kind of pushing the uh, the Victorian view of the future into right? We're on the cusp of a new century, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, a lot of there's been a lot of water under the bridge since we did the first game. Mm -hmm. um, so we did it in 1999. So, um, uh, you know, it's been over 20 years. Uh, I think it makes sense when you do a, a follow-on to just recognize that there's been water under the bridge mm -hmm. for everybody who's who's playing the game. I mean, you don't want to just keep trying to do the go back and recapture the past and keep doing the same thing over and over yeah. again. So I think it's very appropriate to let some time pass and and deal with a different a different period of time with the same, you know, the, the same basic principles, the same basic notion of it being the same world. But it's just later and right. things have happened so many times we see when a new version of a a game comes out they reset the timeline back to the same place that it was mm -hmm. when it first came out mm -hmm. and i like games and game companies that acknowledge hey you may have been, have been playing this game for the last 30 years Mm -hmm. let's acknowledge that time is passing it's a new it's a new jumping off point for both old and new characters yeah it is 30 it, it 1989 is when the oh, okay yeah. yeah yeah that's what yeah so it's been about yeah it has been a little over 30 years yeah well frank um, thank you so much is there anything else you'd like to share about space 1889 or space 1889 after with the fans of strange owl um I, I can't think of anything. All right. Well, uh, Strange Owl fans, check out uh, this interview and more interviews that we have on the channel. We're going to be interviewing more people who've been involved in Space 1889. And Daryl's new rules overviews are going up as well. You can check those out. Uh, we have playlists for both. And uh, Richard is going to start doing his Amboria Designer's Diaries that we will also have a playtest for as we are going forward with that. Well, Frank, thanks for taking time. And uh, we will see you all. Uh, in the near future with more Space 1889 news.